think you nearly think this is very informal, wouldn't you? But um, Kenny, first of all, thank you very much for coming to our, our charity concert. Um, you're more than welcome. Um, but just over a few wee bits and pieces that uh, you've been kicking about quite literally in the football sense for many, many years. But firstly, can you explain that choice of music, please? Yeah, well, um, I used to play that to my players before they went out. And uh, the lyrics are based on, uh, it's from, Vin, what do you call them, Vindictus? No? Uh, Invictus, thank you. Um, and Lavi Sifri sings the song. And it's about people in hardship uh, during the South African stuff that was going on. And it was, if you listen to the words, it's quite uh, natural about something inside so strong. And, and I played that to my girls in the women's team about maybe two or three games, and it gave them great inspiration to uh, go out there and play a football match, with, you know, which is. In comparison, it's not nowhere near uh, as important as a, a tribe of people that was come through hardships. So the words of it and the way he sang it is very, very touching. And uh, I explained that to the girls, and and, and everybody had uh, got something from it, you know. And the words were very appropriate. Thank you very much. Right, Kenny, your playing career, you started off in the 70s and um, you first played singing for Korean and then in no particular order you, you played for Distillery, Tullamore United, Loyola Park, Upperlands and you played for Balamini United under Jim Platt. Um, you swiftly moved into management and that's where um, you had the most successes and you were successful with all your clubs, including Total War, Leola, Upperlands. And with Korean, you won the League Cup and the Championship as well. But there was always been one uh, which has stood out from your local career is Carrick Rangers, who, no disrespect to Carrick Rangers now, obviously are one of the, seem to be one of the smaller clubs. Um, Carrick beat Glen Torn in the final of the County Antrim Shield um, was a replay at Munster Park. Um, we were all at it from the boys right home and obviously being a Linfield supporter I was delighted that he's beat Glen Torn but also delighted that he's won the County Antrim Shield. That's about it with some achievement Kenny. Yeah that was that was quite an achievement because Glen Torn had players from across the water in those days and they had a really strong team and actually the first game went to extra time and in those days you had a replay so we replayed it and um, we won the replay after extra time so it was, it was quite an achievement because when I went to Carrick Rangers um, I also went looking for players they were rank bottom of the, of the whole league and I went to around the junior clubs and got players two players from Lima Valley who played for Rural Valley uh, I got players from Bridge End and Tubbermore and locally uh, I got players, a player from Marfold Sky Blues and it was more or less a junior team that won that shield and the enormity of that was, was quite impressive and I felt that that was one of my greatest times uh, because of where the players had came from and who they were playing against so it was, it was quite a it was a good time. Uh, I remember coming home, uh, I'll track back a little bit. It was uh, 1992. Uh, my father died in February uh, 92 and I had the interview with Kai the week before. And Billy Murray, anybody know Billy Murray who played for Linfield? Fantastic player, maybe some of the older ones. But he got the job and I didn't get it. And then he stood down. So they phoned me up and I just left my father's uh, grave and we come out. Don't be too morbid, sorry about this. But I come out home and hung my coat up and the phone went. 
no mobile phones then, and he said, Kenny, Billy's turned it down, you've got the job. The day, the, you know, we, we just let my father go. So the, the whole the emotion around that was amazing, and I was delighted that we went on and won the cup for, for my father. And uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a top achievement, really good one. Enjoyed that. You were then asked, Kenny, to take over the Northern Ireland under-17s. Um, now, whenever you took them over, I'm right, as they were ranked 48th out of 53 in the European ranking system. So you obviously had a, work, a good bit of work to do there. Um, but again, successful time? Yeah, it was. It was successful in terms of the coefficient. Uh, we finished up ninth, but we... Uh, six years in the bounce, we qualified for the elite stage, and then in one of those years, 2004, we got to the finals. And again, it was all local players um, playing against Fabregas and some of the, the best players in the world. And we played France in the first match, and there were six minutes left, 84 minutes gone, and we hit the other side of the bar, and it was no no, and they went up the pitch. And, Scored from that, the biggest three 0 obviously, with their strength and the players that they had, and the guy who plays for Real Madrid was playing against us as well, and I had players from local clubs here, so it was it was quite an achievement from how that came out. But yes, it was it was a great experience, and it it helped me a lot and gave me the confidence to go to Scotland and to England to. Um, try and get into the football scene there. Well, just as you mentioned, Scotland and England, um, 2007 you moved over to Tranmere Rovers as head of the youth for three years, and then you went to Scotland uh, for a short spell with Martin to help them. To help them. That's right. And then you maybe took a head start, but you decided to, to go to Thailand for six months. Um, and work out there. Um, and then you get back home again, and I know obviously there's one guy here who's a, an avid Derry City supporter. 2014. <laughs> Shh. 2014 to 2017, um, you were Derry City. We, you won the League Cup and you qualified for Europe on two occasions. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed myself in Derry. It's uh, very friendly people, and um, you know. You have to adapt to each culture that you go to, because don't forget a man is Balamina. So the culture of Balamina and the culture of Stroke City is so far apart. You know, it's like two different countries. And then at Coleraine, I was manager there as well, which you probably come to. But my time at uh, Derry City was really good, and the players were again. Um, the, the, the budget we had was nowhere near what the other clubs had, you know, the top three or four. But we were knocking it around that and we managed to get inside that and, you know, the people appreciated that and certainly it was a good chapter for me. I enjoyed that totally. Then, between all that, Kenny, you headed across Scotland um, to be the manager of Kilmarnock where I think I could be wrong, but here we'll chat about it. Probably your best ever achievement uh, uh, to date um, was the League Cup final where you beat Celtic. And we're going to show a wee video here now, um, and then you can have a wee yarn and tell us about some of the. Oh, right, okay. So Yeah. 
foot and the Belgian full centre half. Fantastic goal for Marmot. Great play, great ball, finished by a terrific header. Well, quite incredible. Van Tornout on as a second half substitute. A few moments ago has given Kilmarnock a real chance. Very young, looking Kenny there, wasn't there? <laughs> Kenny, that was obviously uh, a massive achievement. Celtic were then, as it are now, uh, the, the leading club in Scotland, um, probably going for doubles and trebles and, and everything. Um, but for yourselves to beat any of the old firm is bound to be massive. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great feeling, but we beat them that many times, you know. It was like, we were beating Celtic one week and beating Rangers the other. And I remember the build up to that quite vividly that we approached the game and we had our homework done and everything that we could possibly do on every player and the potential of what they were going to bring out. But what I kept saying to them, if some of the older people might remember Ian Ure, anybody? No? Ian Ure played for Manchester United, he played for Arsenal and he was from Kilmarnock and the week of the final he, he met me and just for a chat he says Kenny I'll tell you one thing I've listened to what you've said that you're going to have a go and he says you don't beat the old firm at Hamden in a final you might beat them in the quarter finals or semi finals but you'll not beat them at Hamden I just want you to resign yourself to that so that was my team talk done. Uh, all week I spent that telling the players that we can we can do it. We're going to be to someone different, and we approached it with a, a potential attitude. And to give credit to my staff and I, we decided that we would look at the team, and if we're still inside the game, maybe nil nil or one nil up or whatever, or if we're trying to hold on to something, I'm going to put on a second centre forward and this is what uh, against Celtic, who have never, like, there's not another team has won at um, Hamden in this century to beat any of the old firm and I told them that and I said we're going to be the first and it's still the first. So what we did is, I spoke to them about what we were going to do and how we were going to do it and if we're still inside it, I'm bringing on a second centre forward. So we played two centre forwards, we made the substitution in 73 minutes and in 83 minutes we had scored a goal because Celtic and Rangers, if you watch them play, they're playing against teams who are in quite inferior and the two centre halves are never engaged so we put two up against them and they didn't know what to do and we got down the stage we built that goal up from a defensive free kick outside our box and the full backs one full back crossed the ball and the other full back was at the back post so the remit was the last 20 minutes when I make the sub we're going to go for this and to be honest, Celtic didn't know what had hit them because all of a sudden they have two centre forwards to deal with. And do we go there? Do we go here? So it disrupted their performance and we got our goal from that. And they kept going and I says, no, no, we're going to keep what we have when we scored. And it was, it was great that one substitute crossed the ball and the other substitute scored the goal. So it made you feel from a management point of view that you've, you've made a contribution to that. And um, you know, it was brilliant for Kilmarnock. And I remember we, we uh, played them in October, and this was in 2012. And in 1957, which was 55 years, that Kilmarnock hadn't beaten Celtic at Parkhead. And we went there and we gave a 17 year old his derby and we beat them at Parkhead. In the Rangers Revolution, 
we went to Ibrox that same year and everybody was, the time Rangers was demoted, before, was before they were demoted, but Rangers were like with a vengeance and we ripped them open. My son scored the goal, we beat them 1-0 at Ibrox, we beat them 1-0 at, um, at Kilmarnock as well and all of those achievements to beat them big clubs was very self-satisfying. But it wasn't all about me, it was about what we did and how we did it. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, then coming a wee bit closer to today, 2019, you were appointed the Northern Ireland Women's Manager. Um, um, at the time, they were 43rd in the European rankings. Um, now, whenever you were down there, Kenny, like, what was your, what was your first kind of initial biggest hurdle, you know, would it have been the structure, mindset, you know, the an experience of with the girls or what what was the what was the hardest thing for you to try and, and fix first? Well it took me back to my days with the under seventeens in the Euros when we qualified. But when you go into an international job, international teams you quite the majority of your players is going to be there with you. You can't go out like club football. If the club are have a weakness in such and such a position, then they go and bring in someone else in the window, and you've a chance to build something. But I used the same set players who had won a match maybe once in the four years prior to it, twice maybe against some weak opposition. So the team wasn't functioning properly. So I knew that. If I can't get it from the players from a mental perspective, uh, then we're going to have a, a, a continuation of uh, poor results. So I felt if I could change the mindset to try and help support that mindset, that we have an opportunity here to make this a, a, a big team, a team that's going to do well. And in our first match, after having them for a training session in a four-day camp, I could see that the girls was really, really down on it, and they needed a kick, and they needed someone to come in and help them to believe that they can do it. So from a psychological uh, point of view, I felt they were right up for it. They really wanted to do well and to get some results. In our first match, uh, our goalkeeper, Jackie Burns, who's from this town actually, I, I told her, I want you to make mistakes, which sounds crazy. I remember telling her that before the match. And what I, she didn't know this, but what I was trying to do was to help her move from being afraid and nervous to having no fear of failure and it worked very well, so we, we play a very high risk game in our tactics and she stayed in the ball, she made a couple of mistakes and we're 2 nil down at half time against Norway and she came in and I remember saying to Jackie Jackie, you've been brilliant because you've been brave so we have to have an attitude towards high risk and high success and we did that and Jackie became one of the top keepers in, in the UK because we got someone to trust her and I was able to use that example to the girls. So everybody was uh, feeling good that all of a sudden fear of failure has been removed. So we start to play. So we lost that game 6-0. We played Wales on the Tuesday night following that Friday game and we went, like Wales were 18 in Europe and they were expecting us to be an easy hit and having just lost 6-0 to Norway and we got a 2-2 draw against Wales in Newport. I think we're going to show you just the, the, the second goal here, Kenny, which was the all important last minute. Yeah, go for that, yeah. It was a free kick. Yeah. That made it 2-2. Right in the desk. And Northern Ireland have 
he's went into full time training for six months prior to the Euros. Um, which I'm quite sure for yourself, maybe not as such a big a culture shock, but for your girls who were all part time playing for Linfield, Leptor, Clitical, etc., that's about to be a wee bit of a, a change, game changer for them. Yeah, if you look at where we, we are still to this day, we have players from Glen Torren, Linfield, Cliftonville, Crusaders, that's your four Belfast clubs, which makes up the most of the squad, and they're playing against girls who are playing from Barcelona, Real Madrid, right through my programme, we're playing against players from the top echelons of, of women's football, and the girls were able to compete, and, and actually in my last match, we beat one of the best teams in Europe, with an 82,000 population, 82, 82 million population. We beat Italy and Belfast, and that was my last game. So it was a good time for me to move from the women's game, because I've taken them to that pinnacle for my self-satisfaction, I, I feel that was really good. But you know, you have to keep your modesty within this, because it was the girls that achieved it, not me. But it was a great uh, experience for me, being from Northern Ireland myself and uh, meeting people outside of football. It was it's really good. Well, we've gone down to Euros. Um, as you can see, we have all the t-shirts here that there's about 10 of us from right home went across to support Kenny and the girls to Southampton. Um, a very quiet weekend we did have. Um, the sun was shining, which meant we were fit to get out earlier in the morning and try and walk off the cobwebs. But uh, we were there for the first game, which was the, the Norway match. And yeah, we, we scored we scored against Norway. Um, and I think you was going to possibly play. But even that's, I think that's at the very, very start. It's bound to be a great you know, experience for, for the girls and yourselves to, to walk out for the first game against Norway. Yeah, I thought it was... Uh, this is a goal here. The that? goal, yeah, it was a mishap here. It's a good delivery, not clear the way by Norway. Here's an opportunity for Furnace and there's the header and it's gone over the line! Well, perfect start to the second half. I can't say that stage came out. The green away Norway was going up mad. And it was <laughs> great for the supporters, absolutely. Uh, but it doesn't concur with, you know, I said to the girls, we've got a goal, but that's not where we want to be, to be celebrating the goal as if we've won the World Cup. We got a goal, and maybe I haven't been a bit hard, but I felt that our standards needs to be higher than that, and, and where, where we have our uh, ambition to be. Okay, we scored a goal against Norway, but we lost the match they won. So, you know, that's the perspective. It's, it's not about scoring a goal and losing, because obviously, Julian will go down as the girl who scored the first goal in, in the finals. And who knows when we'll be in the finals next. Yeah, yeah. But um, certainly it's good for her to have done that. But surely with, the, with England beating Norway, I think it was at eight, um, the next game, did yeah. that give you any kind of wee bit of satisfaction? Well, they only beat us. Three, four, wherever, wherever it was. Yes, three, one it was, yeah. I know, I know. It would give us a good boost of confidence to try and go. Like we knew when we went to the Euros it was going to be tough because we're playing against players who are with the top clubs in Europe and the world. And uh, I think we did, we did okay. Well, as I say, um, you could back. You we were back to Hunter Park, as you see here. You would think that that's a, a Northern Ireland man's match, but that's that's a scene um, whenever Northern Ireland ladies or women's play England at Hunter Park. Completely sold out, first time ever in history. Um, and I'm quite sure for that occasion, the girls to walk out at Hunter with the noise and the expectation has been to be again something, an all great experience. Absolutely. The girls, if you put it under perspective, these girls play in the Northern Ireland League and they're playing in front of crowds of parents. You know, the parents come to watch the girls, 
They bring their family. It's a good night out uh, right through with the league starting very soon. So to play in front of 40 people and a dog, the, uh, they then go within a week to play in that match there. It, it's for the children or for the girls. It was it was a very difficult transition to go from playing in front of not very many, but it is improving. You know, we're, but it, when we left the uh, the uh, association, the crowds have gone up considerably, and the participation has gone up considerably as well. And schools and youth clubs and things, you know, in this town as well, they've got a a football club that's very strong and getting stronger and in Miola they've got girls teams so the girls teams are are up and so many numbers there's thousands of people playing it now uh, young girls and developing their game as well it's great to see it so I said Kenny um, obviously there's a possibility of him to Bangladesh um, and maybe maybe come back Couple of years time or whatever, get, maybe get the Northern Ireland Bronze show. But um, as it is, ladies and gentlemen, you can hear what what this man you know has achieved in his career, and it's been success after success after success. And as I said at the very very start, he brought Northern Ireland women's football out from the depths of despair to basically being something we can all be very very proud of. And there's no doubt that whenever we went to Southampton to support yourself and the girls and go to anywhere else. We're always we're always jumping the bit to see how they get on and I'm quite sure for myself and everybody here and anybody else who's watching that there, I would just like to personally say thank you very much for everything that you've done for this country and the football. Um, if you go to Bangladesh or whatever, you can let Alistair and the rest of us know when your first game is and we might be fit to get away to support you again. Probably <laughs> could take a tuck boat. <laughs> You know which way to go. Turn right, don't you? Turn right. <laughs> I'd say money more. But you know, what I would like to say is, and if I don't, I'm sure there's people in the audience who have got the, what, what you're doing this for, Gary. I'm so proud of you, the work that you've put in. I have to say that it's, it's so true. And one of the most important tragedies, because I've got healthy children. So I, my wife and I go in, and I'm blessed to have healthy children. And when there's ch children with cancer, is such a great charity to support. And I'm really glad that you asked me to come along tonight because, you know, we're all part of this world, and you want to. Some people get different uh, cards than, than others do, but it's certainly a fantastic job that you've done, bringing the people together to support the charity. It's absolutely fantastic. Well done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the Kenny's.